The spring of 2013 that I took my first trip to Austin, Texas for South by Southwest Interactive. Uh, if you've never been, it's this giant tech conference uh, in a really cool city um, where all of the big names in tech are coming together to show off what they've been working on. And uh, there's also this huge convention floor um, where you have hundreds of vendors just handing out swag and, and trying to generally make a sale. Well, let's be honest, for me it was mostly about the swag. It was on this convention floor that I met a woman named Anna. Anna was a project manager at a small Washington DC based agency called Three Spot. Uh, her booth immediately caught my eye um, because it had the words fudging care or don't fudging do it emblazoned on a screen. Only they didn't say fudge. Uh, something about this resonated with me. Perhaps it was the liberal use of profanity, but I stopped to compliment their marketing, and I, I got to talking about Anna, about 3Spot and their mission, and they're all about building software with a purpose. If you're building something that you don't really care about, what's the point in doing it? 3Spot intentionally filters some of their client prospects uh, to organizations that are trying to make a positive change in the world. Their client roster includes groups like the National Parks Conservation Association, National Park Service, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, the ACLU, and the Smithsonian Institution. I'm guessing you've probably heard of at least one of those. Had I not been at South by Southwest on the company's dime and I suppose recently bought a house in Columbus, I probably would have quit my job right then to move to DC and work for 3Spot. A large part of my career has been spent on the services side of things, you know, agencies. I've worked for several agencies and dozens of clients, many of whom needed modern websites to attract more customers to sell more stuff. Uh, one agency I did work for is a fast food company, um, nationally, internationally known uh, for their golden arches. I'm not gonna name it names here, but I'm pretty sure you know who I'm talking about. Advanced slide, come on. Ruin the joke timing. Uh, <laughs> Specifically, it was a bunch of regional franchisees that, uh, bond, er, that banded their marketing budgets together. Um, so rather than like one or two restaurants going, hey, we're over here, uh, we were doing work for like 40% of these restaurants in Ohio. There were literally nights when I was home late in order to build websites to sell more cheeseburgers. I, I wasn't pushing social causes or, or life-saving medical products or anything. I was literally selling cheeseburgers. Show of hands. How many people here have heard of cheeseburgers before? Oh, you've heard of them. Wonderful. Please go buy cheeseburgers and buy them from this particular big multinational corporation. That was the message I was spending my nights trying to push. It brought me to the somewhat nihilistic realization that a good portion of the software that we write is, I hate to say it, kind of meaningless. Like, super dumb. Untold hours poured into selling a few more cheeseburgers or, or widgets or whatever. Or building an app that does something that nobody in the history of the human race has needed. But somebody has money and they think it can make them money, so they're willing to pay you to build it for them. Take a moment to let that sink in. All of this work, all of these hours spent doing something as silly as reminding people that cheeseburgers are a viable food option. Doesn't that kind of piss you off a little bit? Like, this is how we're spending our time? That's where I was a, a few years ago, too. But then I learned how to find the deeper meaning in the software that I write, and that's what I want to talk to you about today. If the software is meaningless, we need to either find meaning in what we do, or do something that actually matters. Let's try to look past the cheeseburger for a moment and find meaning in what we're doing today. If it seems that the software we're building is meaningless, maybe try reframing it. Spin around a few times, stand on your head, hop on one foot, whatever you have to do to see that it's not about the cheeseburger. There is no cheeseburger. Okay, th there is a cheeseburger and it's delicious, but the cheeseburger isn't the point here. <clears throat> It's the small franchise owners that we're building software for. The, the people who are creating jobs, they're providing low-cost food opportunities in a community. The work I was doing wasn't for the giant multinational company. 
I was working for the franchise owners, the franchise owners who might own one or two restaurants apiece, and they've pulled their money together to try to remind their neighbors that, yes, we're still here. Sure, our food is exactly the same as thousands of other restaurants across the world, and it's greasy, and it's oversalted, and really it's kind of not very good, but we, the franchise owners, we're still here. Nutritional deficiencies aside, do you know what kinds of people benefit from fast food being in their communities? To be honest, it's not really me. Um, my wife is very big on, on cooking healthy, and uh, we have a, a little kid that she does not want to be a bigger kid uh, that way. Um, so I'm not the one benefiting from fast food restaurants, but you have lower income families. You have single parents struggling to put a hot meal on the table for their kids. You have uh, people who work second or third shifts and they miss out on the traditional restaurants. Have you ever tried going out and getting like a nice dinner at two in the morning? Your options are Taco Bell and the Waffle House. We have the road warriors. We have workers who don't have the privilege of a full hour for lunch and they literally just have time to hit a drive through we have small town folks. Uh, my wife is from a small town up near Mansfield. The nicest restaurants in her town are the fast food places by the highway. It's really kind of depressing. Um, we also have the disabled or retired workers that need these jobs, maybe to keep a roof over their heads or maybe just to stop from slowly drifting off into senility. It's really easy to frame fast food as just cheap, greasy food served up by a multi-billion dollar corporation headed by a literal clown. And that's true too, don't get me wrong. But it also represents a source of food, a sense of, of safety, a sense of community for these people that I've named. So when I was selling cheeseburgers, I wasn't doing it for the clown. I was supporting these small business owners, the people they employ and the people who eat there. It's not what I personally choose to eat, but I realize that I'm fortunate enough to have that choice. Let's get away from cheeseburgers for a second, because frankly, I'm getting hungry and I just had one of the delicious donuts. Bill's Donuts, by the way. Uh, Dayton local, yes? Awesome, good donuts. Um, maybe you're not building marketing websites, but instead you're building applications for companies. You're doing another CRM integration or another CRUD app because Bill and Brenda in accounting can't uh, agree on how the inventory spreadsheet should work. You may have recently spent six solid months of your life building an application that only a handful of people will ever see, use, or even know exists. This is my boss, a guy named Chris Lemma. Uh, and I'm not just name dropping because like star power in first keynote, but star power. Uh, you might know him. Uh, he's generally considered a pretty big deal in the WordPress space. But besides that, he's also a really solid product person. And I'm learning a lot working under him. A few months ago, Chris tweeted this. Never forget why people pay for things. People pay to solve pain. People pay to accelerate a result. People pay to skip failure. People pay to reach a destination. Let's say in this scenario, you've spent the last six months of your, of your life building some internal application. You've been paid for your time. I mean, I certainly hope you've been paid for the last six months of your life. And sure, only a few people will ever use, see, or even know about the app that you've built. But which of these reasons is the reason that they hired you to do it? Do they have a pain point that you helped them solve? Was something really error prone before and now you've put the guardrails in place to make sure that it just works? Maybe there was a process that was really slow and it caused them a lot of pain. At the end of each month was someone spending days or weeks compiling numbers for some leadership report, and now that process takes seconds rather than days. How much time did you just save that person through your work? Did someone invest in you for your knowledge, knowing that, yeah, I probably could figure this out, and then 18 months later they'd be like, oh no, I've, I've stressed myself out, I don't know anything, this is terrible, and they went, no, I'm going to hire the person who knows what they're doing, I'm going to trust them to build it, I'm going to pay them to build it, and I'm going to have something that I can rely on. Or maybe their company needed to get somewhere. 
did you just replace an old billing system that was storing payment information insecurely, for instance? Because, I mean, I know that's, that's a, a shocker that there's, there are payment systems that store payment information insecurely. But can that company now claim PCI compliance? Does that open up new markets to them, new business opportunities? Did your efforts enable those handful of users to do their jobs better, therefore moving that whole company forward, or freeing them up to do what they do best? My brother is an AV technician at a hospital back home. He and his team are responsible for all of the teleconferencing equipment, all of the projectors and things in this, this giant medical campus. The number of times he's had to hike like a mile across campus to go help some doctor turn on a projector, it's more times than he cares to count. But I want you to remember that the people giving presentations in hospitals these aren't usually dumb people. These are often renowned surgeons or doctors or researchers. Yeah, they might struggle getting Skype working properly. But as much as I love my brother, I can guarantee you I'd rather have them work on me if my appendix were to burst than to have my brother, who has no medical training but is really good at computers, uh, operating on me. If your job enables other people to do their jobs well, you're contributing. Sure, he's turning on a projector. And to be fair, a trained surgeon probably shouldn't have any issues turning on a projector. I mean, it's not like it's, well, surgery. But uh, if the act of turning on that projector means that this surgeon can present findings that, for instance, can help end childhood leukemia, then dude, you turn on the projector. This goes double if you're a manager. If you have people working under you, Making sure that they see the positive impact of their work, how they're contributing to the, the larger and greater good, that should be one of your top priorities. Make it easy for them to see uh, how they're helping other people and reinforce that they're not just toiling away at some meaningless task, you know, working towards some unseen goal. People pay to solve pain. People pay to accelerate a result. People pay to skip failure. People pay to reach a destination. Which of these are you doing for your clients? Once you're able to reframe what you're working on, as trivial as the work may seem, it's possible to find meaning in the otherwise meaningless. You're not just writing it to sell more, so or to sell more cheeseburgers. You're writing software for the people. Let's look at the other side. What if it is as shallow as it seems? After all, sometimes a cheeseburger is, well, it's really just a cheeseburger. You can twist it a hundred different ways, but not absolutely everything is going to have some deeper meaning behind it. Maybe you're working for a startup whose stated mission is to, quote, get paid and get laid, man. Nice. Worse, maybe you're working for the bad guys. If your employer or your clients are trying to sell cigarettes to kids or restrict access to healthcare, or locking babies in cages. Well, it's going to be a lot harder to pinpoint those positive attributes. If the work you're doing today isn't helping people, or worse, it's actively hurting people, then what are you doing? If you're not actively making the world a better place with what you're doing, or, or empowering other people to make progress, then it's time to make a change or get out of the game. I'd like to introduce you to a friend and colleague of mine. This is uh, Andrew Norcross. Most people just call him Norcross. Uh, and Norcross here, he has what I like to call a strong social conscience. Um, if you haven't met him, he's, he's covered in tattoos. You can see Milhouse there on his forearm. Uh, he's a proud Floridian, and he can talk your ear off about genres of heavy music that I'm not entirely sure actually exist, but he seems really excited, so I just sort of nod my head and go, oh yeah, no, they were great. All right, so here come the politics, and, and I'm not looking to get into a debate here. It's far too early for that. Um, find me at the after party, and I'm, I'm happy to do this, but for those who don't know me, let's just say that I'm not the biggest fan of the current US president or the people he surrounds himself with. Yeah, that's, that's probably a, a nice way to put it. Anyway, in the, the summer of 2018, the Trump administration came under fire for their uh, zero-tolerance family separation policy. 
if families were caught illegally crossing the border into the United States, uh, the policy basically stated that children should be separated from the adults that they were traveling with. The reasoning from the Trump administration being something along the lines of if they're afraid to be separated from their families, they'll be less likely to attempt to cross. Something of an oversimplification, sure, but let's, let's roll with it for now. So these children, around 3,000 that we know of, were separated from their families. Of course, you can't just send them back home. They literally just crossed the border with their families. Um, so what do you do with a bunch of kids? I mean, clearly, you lock them in detention centers, right? I mean, not like some daycare center like where we send my kid, uh, you know, oh, go play with the other kids while we process the family. No, it's something more along the lines of a fun-sized internment camp. Anyway, good people don't abide this kind of injustice. Norcross? Norcross is good people. On a Friday evening, a friend of Norcross has reached out and asked him uh, for some help scoping out a, an important but time-sensitive project. Uh, by the end of the call, Norcross had cleared his entire weekend and set to work. In a conversation I had with Norcross about the project, he said, by late Sunday, I realized it was a larger project than any of us imagined, but I don't think I could have lived with myself but I don't think I could have lived with myself if I just said, sorry, too busy. The project, as it turned out, was a collaboration between the Vera Institute of Justice and New America called the Immigrant Connection Project, or ICON. They were building a tool to help attorneys who were working around the clock to reunite these separated families and ensure due process for all involved. From the ICON website, ICON is a resource for parents who have been separated from their children due to the administration's zero tolerance policy as well as for the attorneys of these parents to locate and connect with the legal service providers working with their children. Our boss, Chris, he was completely supportive, 100%. Developing and iterating on our products is, is absolutely important. I mean, after all, that's how we get paid, but losing one developer for a week or two to help reunite kids with their families, that's a bit more important than shipping something off the roadmap. So Norcross spent the next week or two work days, evenings, weekends, just completely focused on his work for ICON. Ultimately, children in around 100 of these centers uh, were processed by ICON, aiding attorneys in reuniting the families. It's far from everyone, but it was absolutely a step in the right direction. Another quote from my chat with Norcross, uh, pushing back against the evil you see in the world is more than just punching Nazis. Uh, I mean, that's absolutely an important part, but the ultimate act of rebellion is insisting on compassion, kindness, and grace in what has become a pretty dark world. When you talk, think about the positive impact of Norcross's work, how he was willing to put everything he had in helping these kids that he's never met before, he'll likely never meet again, that's using software for the greater good. It's, it's using your abilities, your skills to make a positive change in the world. Maybe you're not dealing with external forces, though. Maybe your employer is doing things that just don't feel right. Whatever your beliefs, however you feel, however you twist this, you just feel deep in your gut that what they're doing is wrong. We don't have to love our jobs, but it's really nice when we're not embarrassed or have to whisper who we work for. We're not like, oh, I work for that company, but let's... Um, I, I sincerely hope that everyone in this room has a job that they can be proud of, or if not proud of, at least not wake up feeling disgusted by. Companies don't always make the best decisions. I, honestly, that's really putting it lightly, but it doesn't mean that we're bad people for working for them or having them as clients. After all, warm fuzzies don't put food on the table. That doesn't absolve us from responsibility, though. If you knew the work you were doing was being used to hurt people, would you still do it? Let's say you produce fencing for a living, and someone says, hey, we need you to build cages so that we can lock up more kids in these detention centers. Would, would you be okay with that? On a lighter note, last summer, <laughs> Facebook released an app in the app marketplaces called Onavo Protect. It was meant to be a free virtual VPN, or ugh, free virtual private network, or VPN. Um, after all, being busy 21st century people, we're all on the go, right? We don't want to 
be sitting in a uh, coffee shop or an airport or a conference and having someone sitting over in the corner like stealing our passwords. So VPNs are awesome, don't get me wrong. But a good VPN needs to keep your data private. Kind of in the name, virtual private network. And I'm not just talking about being private from people on your network, but private from the virtual private network service itself. Logs need to be purged or not kept at all. And you certainly shouldn't be paying someone to then just turn around and sniff your traffic. Unfortunately, a lot of the free or low-cost VPNs, well, they have to make their money somehow. So sometimes they do some less than awesome things with our data. Onavo Protect uh, was being run by a little company you may have heard of called Facebook. Yeah, that Facebook. Uh, let me remind you, Facebook's this giant corporation that's made billions by collecting data through, let's say, uh, less than honest means. Um, I mean, in order to sell really targeted advertising uh, or ad placements to advertisers, if an advertiser wanted to target, let's say, white guys named Steve uh, within two miles of this building, you can bet that Facebook could accommodate that request. Facebook is amazing at what they do, but they employ, and they employ a lot of great, well-meaning people. But the core of what Facebook does is collect as much information about you as possible. So they launch a novel Protect, a free VPN to lull people into this false sense of security. Oh, great, I can go do my banking, I can go communicate with people, whatever, because I'm on a VPN, so it doesn't matter that I'm on a public Wi-Fi network. You're on a VPN owned by one of the biggest abusers of online privacy that we've ever seen. Worst yet, Onavo Protect operates at a lower level than most applications on your phone. This isn't just Facebook saying, haha, we're gonna see everything you do in the Facebook and Instagram apps. And don't worry, they do that too. But because it's a VPN and it's working at a lower level on your phone's operating system, they can see all of the traffic going through your phone. Are you sending an email? Facebook's aware of it. Are you playing words with friends? Facebook sees the traffic. Every API endpoint, every URL that's being hit, Facebook knows about it. So Apple caught on and was like, yeah, we're gonna need you to cut this out. So Facebook pulled Onavo Protect. But then this year, 2019, news broke that they re-released it as Facebook's research VPN. They even went around the, uh, the App Store's rules by using their enterprise certificate. That's the the thing that allows uh, companies at the size of like Facebook to say, hey, we're going to have an app that people can put on their phones to say, uh, hey, what's for lunch today in the company cafeteria, but not have to distribute it. So something meant for private internal use, they start using this to distribute this invasive VPN to the general public. Worse yet, they start offering to pay people to install this. So they're, they're literally going, sir, may I bug you? Literally, may I? Intercept all of your traffic. Here's $20 for your trouble. Look at that handsome guy. Uh, I'm reminded of when I was 18. It was before smartphones, but right as Facebook was getting started. So I'll let you do the math. Some friends of mine got involved with one of those programs where they go around and they say, hey, you can get a free t-shirt. Free t-shirt. Uh, anyone else do that? Yeah, we've been there. Um, so a dumb free t-shirt in exchange for a credit card that 18-year-old Steve absolutely did not need. I'll be honest, looking back, I can't tell you what the t-shirt said. I wore it maybe once or twice, if, if ever, uh, and it was probably just some bad pun because, well, that's who I am now and that's who I was then, too. So I get this t-shirt and I'm, I'm home for Christmas or something. And my mom, uh, my mom is a CFO, by the way. So my mom, my CFO of a mother, is like, so Steve, uh, this credit card showed up with your name on it. I'm like, oh, fudge. Only I also did not say fudge. Um, so I'm having this conversation trying to justify why getting a, a stupid free t-shirt was worth like Didn't need, wasn't going to use, didn't have the money to pay off even if I did use it, because again, 18-year-old Steve. Um, let me tell you, that's a conversation I would rather never have again. Uh, so far, so good. Um, 
I tell you this all to remind you that teenagers don't always make the best decisions. I certainly didn't, and I, I'm guessing that you probably made some mistakes in your youth too. So think back to when you were younger. If Facebook approached you and said, hey, we'd like to pay you, uh, we want to give you this free VPN, hell, it's so free, we'll even pay you to install it, would you have taken them up on the offer? I can tell you that guy would have. But uh, Now, what if you were on the other side and, and you were working uh, for Facebook? Sure, developing a, a performant, easy to install, easy to run VPN. Um, if people have used VPNs, they know they're not always the most user-friendly thing. That could be a really fun challenge. Hey, I'm going to make VPNs more prevalent. I'm going to put this out there. People are going to be able to be on VPNs and be secured, and it's going to be wonderful. And then you remember, oh yeah, Facebook. And then you get told, oh, by the way, we're going to need you to steal all sorts of data. If, if the terms of service uh, basically say, hey, we're going to let you use this for free, but we're going to extract as much data as we possibly can, is that something that you, as, as a developer, as a product manager, as a project manager, as, as an SEO person, as a business person, is that something that you can feel comfortable with? Again, Facebook has done a lot for open source software, and it's supposed to have this amazing engineering culture, but that doesn't mean that Facebook's a good company. Working for Facebook doesn't make you a bad person either. We're not our companies after all, but we have to weigh the good and the bad in what we do and see how our contributions are pushing the needle. Another company that has a uh, not so sterling reputation is a little ride-sharing giant called Uber. Um, <clears throat> in 2017, news of Uber's Grayball program broke. The general idea was essentially to flag users that Uber felt had the, uh, the wherewithal or the means to uh, violate or more, like, or more accurately undermine Uber's terms of service. City officials or anyone else who might try to go after Uber for any number of violations would end up getting served uh, a fake version of the app. They'd get fake data, fake drivers. They'd be like, oh, I just can never seem to get an Uber. What's going on with this? Now, let's be clear. This wasn't your friendly neighborhood Uber driver just kind of going like, yeah, I'm not going to pick up any fares right now. This was something built into the application, pushed out from the top uh, to help protect Uber's interests. The way that Uber was flagging people who could you know, potentially undermine them, was really fascinating, though, if I'm being honest. In an expose by the New York Times, we learned a few ways that Uber would flag pot a potential city official. They would do some geofencing around government offices. Basically, if you were in a government office and you were pretty regularly like opening the app but then not ordering a ride, um, they figured, OK, they're just trying to see if people are around. They're doing research on us. Um, and they're doing it near a government office. So we're going to go ahead and flag them as someone who's probably a government employee. Uber would also reportedly look up the financial institutions linked to customers' credit cards. If your card is tied to a police credit union, uh, for example, there's a good chance that you're either a law enforcement officer or you're related to one. There's also a good chance that at this time you could not get an Uber. The expose even re uh, revealed that Uber would go as far as keeping a catalog of some of the most inexpensive uh, smartphones available, uh, you know, the prepaid stuff you'd get at the grocery store. Um, because cops aren't going to spend big money on expensive burner phones uh, if they're running a sting operation. I'll confess, from an OPSEC perspective, reading this was really like, oh, that's really cool. Like, it sucks that it's really unethical and everything, but, it, I mean, it's an interesting, fun sounding challenge. It's like a game of cat and mouse or cops and robbers, except I guess in this case you're actually going against the cops, which makes it less of like a fun game and more of a criminal racket. But I can empathize with the developers who thought this would be a great challenge to solve. How do we determine what users might fit into each cohort? It's a fun analytical puzzle, and it's something that's great if, for instance, you're trying to serve more relevant content to your users. It's a little different when you're using it to evade law enforcement, though. And with that kind of profiling algorithm, it's not hard to let our imaginations run wild as to like, oh, what groups might they exclude from being able to get an Uber next? 
I'm not going to stand up here and tell you these are bad companies and you shouldn't work for them. That's, that's not my place. And I understand that sometimes we take jobs because that we're not 100% cool with because, you know, we need to put food on the table. What I would like to do is challenge you to find the good in what you're doing and make sure that the good isn't being outweighed by the bad. If you're in a situation where your contributions are being used to cause harm, then I implore you, as the good person that you presumably are, to make a stand. Speaking up or standing your ground against bad actors is rarely easy. And I absolutely recognize the irony of me, a, a middle-class, cisgender, straight white male, standing up here and telling you, don't let people push you around. It hurts. The, the irony is so sharp it hurts. But we can't all just quit our jobs as much as we might like to. If you live somewhere where the job market isn't great, it can be absolutely terrifying to stand up and say, I object to what we're doing. Again, warm fuzzies aren't going to put food on the table. So what can we do? If we're stuck working for a company that upsets our stomach, how can we find purpose in it? Does the job offer training or educational opportunities that we can use to better our situation? It's not unheard of, as Dustin was saying, for people to go to conferences, meet new people, and then have those connections lead to their next job. That's one of the big benefits of going to something like this WordCamp. Remember, if I hadn't just bought a house when I met Anna in, uh, at South by Southwest, I might be living in DC working for 3Spot right now. Are there other good people in the company who you can connect with and learn from? The company might not be a good company, but if you're working for someone at the scale of Facebook or Uber, chances are they're probably employing some pretty smart people. If you're working in marketing, for instance, and you have the opportunity to work, side along, work alongside people doing you know, like big multinational campaigns, that's an amazing learning opportunity. Take advantage of that. Maybe the meaning in what you're doing is the personal growth. Yeah, that project was really rough and you, know, you got reprimanded by your manager or the higher ups or whatever because it shipped late or it went over budget or whatever. But maybe it was a less than successful launch because you had to dive really deep, learn some new technology you've never worked with before. And now you can leverage that knowledge and that experience in your next project or in your next job. They say a mistake is only a mistake if you don't learn from it. Can the same be said about a bad project? If you're in a bad situation that you can't get out of right now, try to find ways to make that bad situation work for you. To be clear, I'm 100% absolutely not advocating that you like, go steal company secrets or start some rogue uh, Twitter account to you know, be a whistleblower. I mean, maybe don't. Not be a whistleblower with some rogue account, because those are a lot of fun to follow. But what I'm saying is find a way to make your employment at least mutually beneficial. Remember, the company is paying for your time and your talents, but the company doesn't own you. You can look outside of your company, too. Maybe you can't drop the 9 to 5 right now, but you have some time outside of work to volunteer. Maybe a local nonprofit can use your skills, or you can spend some time writing blog posts to help teach other people. If I may share a little secret, one of the best ways to learn something really well is to have to try to teach it to somebody else. Um, it, if you've ever been afraid, like, oh, but I don't have enough experience to do this, try getting up on stage and saying, oh, let me pretend to be an expert here. You're going to learn that thing really well so you don't look like an ass. Um, that's personally what I do with every one of my, my technical talks. So please, join us after lunch for my, my second talk of the day. If you're interested in speaking, maybe try with your local meetups. They're often looking for speakers, and you'll be able to share what you've learned uh, for groups that are local to you and help those people grow. Once you've spoken at a few local meetups, maybe take that show on the road. Employers are often happy to send you to conferences. It's, it's time away from work, but they get to look like you know progressive thought leaders. And you're like, ha-ha, time to travel and hang out. And it's your name on the marquee at the end of the day. If you're looking for a way to get out of your current job, sharing what you know can be a great way to do that. It helps put you on other people's radars. Whether it's blogging or, or speaking, YouTube videos, uh, writing for magazines, publishing ebooks, 
being known for being a teacher can open far more doors than most jobs can on their own. If teaching's not your thing, find some other ways to better yourself. Pick up a new skill, make some new connections, reach out to local user groups, and maybe try to get your company to sponsor them. I mean, after all, if Facebook is going to steal like all of our data, they should at least buy us some pizza first, right? Sweet coffee. So we've learned how to either reframe what we're doing to find the deeper meaning, or to jump ship and find something that actually makes a difference. Why is this important though? At the most basic level, it provides that simple gratification, that validation knowing that the time and energy that we've spent hasn't been wasted. We've solved somebody's problem. We've, we've helped someone go further. We've helped someone go faster. We've reduced someone's pain. All of those reasons Chris was talking about, we've helped somebody do something. We've done something for somebody else. And yes, sometimes that somebody else, we can be selfish and it's, uh, yay, I, I helped myself. But a lot of times we're helping other people or, or a group of people. You feel good because your time was spent making the world a better place. And that doesn't mean that you can't and shouldn't be compensated for your work, but You've applied your skills and your talent to help somebody. That's an amazing feeling, isn't it? Do you want to find purpose in what you do? Maybe try looking beyond your personal life experiences and try to think about how your talents can be used to help somebody else. To have empathy is to show understanding of and relate to how other people are feeling. If someone's upset, you're there for them with more than just a, a friendly, oh, it'll be okay, it's cool. You try to put yourself in their position and understand why they're feeling the way they are, especially before you try to offer advice. Maybe something's really easy for you, but other people aren't you. In short, empathy is being willing to put other people's problems ahead of your own, even just for a moment. By taking time to empathize with others, their, their struggles, their pains, you're far more likely to be able to come up with better solutions and better ways to help people because you can see the problem from their perspective. If you take everything that you know right now, and I don't care if you're a developer, if you're a project manager, if you're a business person, if you're a strategist, whatever, take what you know right now and imagine one of your client's problems or one of your customer's problems. Look at it through the, how they would be seeing it, but with the lens of all of the, what you know. You're able to look at them and you're able to say, I understand how you feel or where you're struggling and here's how I can help. They're gonna think you have superpowers because you're able to take your experiences and funnel it through their perspective. Empathy also leads to better work. How many stories have we heard about some well-meaning app that made it easier for, for instance, someone to get stalked? Having empathy is looking critically at an idea, no matter how good the intentions are and asking, how could this be used to hurt someone? If you don't know, look around the room. Talk about the, the idea with people who don't share your same life experiences or, or your privilege. And most of all, listen to what these people have to say. Closely paired with empathy is compassion. Doing good for others without expecting anything in return. Life isn't some business transaction or, or quid pro quo. Sometimes you'll put good out into the world and nothing will come of it. But at the end of the day, I don't know about you, but I sleep much better knowing that I've tried my best to make the world a better place rather than just shrug people off. Again, I'm not saying you need to go out there and do this stuff for free. Put your mask on before helping others after all, but having a bit of empathy and compassion, that can make all of the difference to someone. Let's talk about accessibility for a moment. I'm very fortunate uh, in a lot of ways, but uh, physically I have full mobility, full use of my senses. Heck, even my glasses aren't that strong. I have no color blindness, no dyslexia, physically speaking, nothing that I could claim as a quote disability. Now, let's take my right arm away. Being right-handed, that's going to be a hindrance. And maybe my left arm isn't great at holding things steady. So your click targets better be big enough that I'm not fat fingering cancel every time I try to order a pizza through your app. Take away my glasses. Am I able to read the text? Okay, don't blindfold me. Am I able to navigate your, your site, your application, using assistive technology like a screen reader? Now take off the blindfold 
give me my glasses back, but take away my ability to discern color. Am I going to be able to tell at a glance the difference between a major error notification and like a, hey, your thing was updated successfully, good job, type message in your app? Am I going to be able to find the links if I can't tell black from blue in your body copy? Empathy means putting yourself in other people's shoes and seeing what issues they might run into. Not everybody is as fortunate as I am, but if I build a piece of software that, for instance, can't be navigated with a keyboard, well, that's on me. Accessibility isn't a feature, and treating it as such is a slap in the face of everyone who can't use your software. I don't know how to explain to you that you should care about other people. This was the headline of a story on Huffington Post on June 26th, my dad's birthday, 2017, and it captured the feeling that accessibility advocates have been feeling, well, forever. Caring about other people isn't a weakness. It's not some add-on or premium extra. Giving a shit about the people around us should be table stakes if we're building software, creating content, or in any way being a part of the society. Accessibility matters because empathy matters, because people matter. Never forget that, please. I suppose what I'm trying to say in all of this is that ultimately most of the software we write isn't exactly busting at the seams with purpose. If we want to be able to look back at how we've spent our lives, we need to recognize this. I don't want to be 80 years old and telling my grandchildren about all of the garbage cheeseburgers I helped sell. I, I don't want to spend 40 hours a week, 2,000 hours a year, building stuff that doesn't matter. So we can find purpose in what we create. Think about the, the people it employs, the mouths it feeds, the anguish it relieves, the, the communities it can help create and support. Or we can find something to do that we can be proud of. No matter the path, we owe it to ourselves as professionals to practice empathy in everything we do. If you're not helping somebody in need, what are you doing? Find meaning in what you do. Or find something that does have purpose. Either way, move forward with empathy. Again, I, I really don't like to be cheesy with my message, but we only get one chance at this life. We can choose to be a force for good, a force for evil, or just hang out somewhere in between. But I don't know about all of you, but I'd much rather spend my life trying to find a way to put good into the world uh, than selling garbage or making other people's lives more difficult. The software that we write shouldn't be for a company. You're not just writing it to sell more cheeseburgers. You're writing software for the people. Thank you. <laughs>